Hi, I'm Helen Bauer, and this is the Heart of Hospice podcast. The Heart of Hospice podcast is your source for compassionate and informative discussions about hospice and end-of-life care. I'm a certified hospice and palliative care nurse with over 15 years of experience. Whether you're a caregiver, someone with a serious illness, or you simply need to know more about hospice care, this podcast is for you. Join me as we explore all the aspects of hospice, from the details of caregiving to the emotional and spiritual dimensions of -of end-of-life journeys. For more resources and to connect with me, visit theheartofhospice.com and find us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Keep listening for today's episode. This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time. Content presented in the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the host and guest and may not represent the views and opinions of the Whole Care Network. Always consult with your physician for any medical advice, and always consult with your attorney for any legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. This special episode of the Heart of Hospice podcast is being sponsored by The Death Deck, featuring the end-of-life deck. The end-of-life deck is used by many healthcare providers as a casual way to help start conversations about end-of-life wishes. It helps people communicate what matters most to them. To learn more about the EOL deck, visit thedeathdeck.com. Today's special episode is part two of our four-part special series featuring hospice educator Barbara Carnes. Barbara has worked in hospice for over 40 years, holding positions as a staff nurse, clinical supervisor, and executive director. Her book, Gone From My Sight, is now an industry standard for explaining the death and dying process. Also known as the Little Blue Book, it's sold over 40 million copies. Barbara is the expert that end-of-life workers go to for guidance and leadership. You can find her resources at bkbooks.com. In our conversation, Barbara shared what hospice was like before the Medicare hospice benefit was introduced. The myths about hospice that were present back in the 1980s are still with us today, and Barbara explained why. Barbara also detailed the pain management systems that were first used in hospice, including the Brompton Cocktail. Enjoy this second episode of our special series with Barbara Carnes. Barbara, welcome back to episode number two of our special series. Thanks for coming back and joining me. Of course. This has been fun. We'll keep it going. All right. So this is the second episode, but I have a different icebreaker question for you to get our conversation started. I know, I know. Um, So today's icebreaker question is different. It doesn't come from the death deck. It actually doesn't have anything to do with end of life. So if you could be queen of the world, who would be your top three advisors? Holy smoke. Can... Can I bring them back from the dead? Yes, yes. Dead or alive, um, real or imaginary. Oh, okay. Whatever you like. Well, I would I would bring um, Elizabeth Kubler Ross back. Um, I would bring her back, and I had a a spiritual teacher named Ann Manser. I would bring her back. Nice. Um, wow. And a third one. You can tell how small my world is. I should be able to come up with. No, the fact that you would bring back Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, that sounds pretty broad and big thinking to me. 
Um, wow, I, I my mind is a blank. Uh, will you settle for two? Yes, I will let you off the hook with just two. Oh. <laughs> I love it. All right, so we're moving forward with our conversation today. We're we're basically doing a retrospective on your hospice career and all the years that you've spent working in in end of life care. So I want to look back at when you first started working in the eighties, right? Medicare was just coming uh, to be. Um, hospice teams were sort of feeling their way and figuring out what they were supposed to be doing because there wasn't really a model at that point for taking care of people who were dying. Um, let's talk about the interdisciplinary teams. I, I'm, I'm calling it an interdisciplinary team because I'm assuming that they did have the different disciplines. But what was the structure and what kind of culture did interdisciplinary teams have in the early part of your career? We had... Um the two nurses, Jody and I, there was a social worker, and there was a chaplain, and there was a psychologist bereavement coordinator, and a director of the agency. And Jody and I, the social worker, and the chaplain would meet uh, at least once a week, but sometimes more if there was some pertinent issues. And we'd just sit around the table and talk. And we'd talk about the patients. And our census in the early beginning was, um, I would say, from 12 to 15, but we continued to grow. There was no home health aid. Jody and I did the bathing, and the social worker only came if we, Jody and I, thought she was needed. Hmm. Um, so she was, and the same with the chaplain. Um, there were no requirements that they would come in uh, unless we felt it was needed. So really, Jody and I were in charge, and. To start with, Jody was in charge because when I started, never having worked in the medical arena, I volunteered um, 20 hours a week. And that lasted for four months. And then they brought me on staff. But it was really Jody and I that talked about the patients that we we were basically it. And it wasn't until, um, really until the Medicare uh, hospice came out with their first um, format on how to run a hospice. Before that, it was, you know, sometimes Jody and I would go together if we didn't have a lot of patients. And because we took call every other week, so on 24-7, off 24-7, and in the daytime saw patients, um, we saw the same patients. We sometimes, if the census was low, we went together. Um, but everyone knew both of us, um, which I think was a good thing, because then they didn't have in an emergency um, a stranger. So we didn't even have our medical director um, as part of the team until we became Medicare certified. Interesting. Um, then he came and he was a cardiologist. And honestly, he didn't know a thing about end of life. Yeah. Um, and he was just interested and they recruited him and he was there once a week. Uh, and by this time, I'm the director and also doing the role of uh, clinical coordinator. So I was wearing two hats. So I was in on all the, the meetings that we'd have every Monday morning. And then the rest of the week, we were on our own and coordinated with each other because we were just a little family. So all the rules about 
how you were supposed to function and how often you were supposed to meet, you know, the, the every two weeks and all of that. None of that was in place when you first started. No. You guys were just sort of talking and meeting according to the needs of the census and the patients. Yes, kind of in the back of our head, it was everyone should be seen once a week. And we also had longer lengths of stay because they at that time they couldn't even people couldn't even pronounce the word hospice, let alone know what it was. And so we would get referrals earlier. Um, because these were kind of outliers that were willing to take a, a, a chance on hospice care. So no one really knew what hospice care was about, which is why we made it up as we went along. So um, there were, I would say, at least once a week, and then very quickly, we were seeing them a couple of times a week, and they may be months from death, because we didn't know how people were going to die. We didn't know there was a, a process to it. So we had to learn that too. And, and so we didn't even know what we were looking for to tell us that death is going to be in 24 hours or three days. So we saw them more frequently because we didn't know. And it, it just took actually several years to recognize that, oh, there's a pattern to dying. There's a time frame. Here's what you look for. Um, but in those early days, we didn't know that. We just wanted to be there. And there wasn't a, a six-month terminal prognosis rule at that point for admission. What diagnoses were you seeing in your patients that you were admitting? Uh, mostly cancer. Um, one or two ALS. Mm -hmm. um, but really, COPD was questionable because with COPD, you look like you're going to die tomorrow. And 10 years later, you look like you're going to die tomorrow. So you can't, you know, give a really and come to any conclusion about when they're appropriate for hospice, but mostly, mostly cancer. Some out well, then I have to say we had the AIDS crisis. And so yes. then we had um, AIDS patients also. So what about Alzheimer's and dementia? That's the biggest group or the biggest population of Medicare hospice patients. Uh, not biggest. It's the fastest growing these days. Did you have many of them? None. None. That was not an issue. Interesting. It, it's in the last few years that de dementia has become huge and and recognized um as a serious illness from as long as I can remember old people um had senile dementia that was mm -hmm. when I was in a nurse's aid we had people in the hospital for years in the hospital only thing was dementia but we didn't call it dementia, right. really. It was senility. Thank you. Yes, that's yeah. exactly what it was. So um, that wasn't an, considered an end-of-life diagnosis. That was just a part of being old. And um, I don't know where along this line... Alzheimer's and all of the different diseases that cause dementia were figured out. Um, but somewhere along the line, and now my hardest challenge, is, I think, for hospice is um, when to take on 
someone who has dementia. Right. I think it's way overused. Well, and it's a it's a real challenge for agencies to figure out where that quote unquote end stage point is for so mm-hmm. many dementia patients. And that's what leads to problem with length of stay, live discharges. I mean, you name it, it it, it is a really challenging diagnosis. Um so this is interesting. You didn't automatically incorporate the social worker and chaplain. It was basically uh, until the hospice Medicare model came into being, you guys were just utilizing the other disciplines when something came up and it seemed like there was a need. Yes. we, The two of us nurses were everything. Now we had volunteers, but not a whole lot of them. When I started, we did not have a volunteer coordinator. But when the Medicare benefit came to be, then we had a volunteer coordinator. But we did have volunteers. Um, and now I don't quite remember. I Probably the executive director, probably Kevin, uh, dealt with the volunteers. Coordinated them and recruited yeah. them. We really, in those, before Medicare hospice, every agency made it up as they went along. There was no consistent hospice care. Um, We had ideas, but we didn't coordinate. And so it was whatever the, the particular agency, and there weren't a lot in there were only three starting out in uh, in Kansas City, and the one I was involved with was the oldest and the first. Um, so it was really virgin territory. It, there was no standards or ideas even of what to do because no one taught us what to do. Did agencies collaborate or talk with each other about what they were doing. It's so competitive these days. Everybody's very protective of their own proprietary um, materials and forms, et cetera, and processes. But did agencies back then collaborate at all? Well, I can only speak for mine and Kansas City, but yes, we did. Um, And Kansas developed a board and an agency for the state um, to get home health certified. There was a hospice in a close, small town to Kansas City. And he came over and we taught, the director of that hospice came over. We talked, he gave me their policy and procedure manual. Which is completely unheard of these days. Nobody would do that. No. and um, But there was, it, we weren't competitive. We mm-hmm. were all in the same boat and we were all learning. And so we all shared what we knew. And that was beautiful. Yeah. You know, that was beautiful. And we knew nurses um, that worked, you know, for VNA in their hospice. We knew and shared and met for our margaritas. And, you know, it was collaborative citywide. Yeah, that is nice. So as you guys begin integrating and and bringing on the social worker and the chaplain as part of the core team, when that structure came into being with the Medicare hospice benefit, how did you find your yourself and your team, you and Jody? how were you influenced by these other disciplines, the other members of the team? Did it change the way you were doing things? Not really. It, I have to say, by the time we were Medicare certified, we had two other nurses because our our census had grown. And I can't remember exactly how many we had, but we had four nurses, still didn't have a, never had a home health aid. It was just part of the nurse's job uh, because that's when people are most vulnerable and talk the most is when they're laying in bed naked. You know, right. that 
um, is, is a great way of, of getting to know someone. So even then, the social worker and the chaplain did not make regular visits. It was only on a name. It wasn't until Medicare said there has to be a social work visit. Um, and I don't even remember them saying there had to be a chaplain visit. But that could, that's my memory. Um, so, and because we were so close knit, and because we saw the patients so frequently, it was just natural at team meeting to say to the social worker, here's what's happening. What do you think? And so even more than seeing patients, they were our support in team meeting um, in giving us guidance and knowledge. And that's sad if you really think about it because in thinking back, we didn't utilize them, uh, social worker, chaplain, to the extent that is used today. We didn't appreciate them. I look back now and think, wow, they would have added so much more if we had utilized them. Yeah. But it was all about nursing. I mean, that's all we knew. And that's, you know, how it started out was um, people are going to die and nurses are going to be there. Well, we were thinking of it as a, a clinical process, oh, right? It's a biological process. And so the nurses are the ones to handle that under the supervision of a doctor. And yet what we found out was it's, um, what do you say? It's a relational experience, a relational event, a communal event, all these different things, mind, body, and spirit. And so we eventually morphed, although the, the regulations do force some of that, but we, we have changed and made so many iterations that we have come to incorporate all these different disciplines to provide the care. My conversation with Barbara Carnes isn't over, so stay with us to hear more. This special episode is made possible by our friends at the Death Deck. The Death Deck has created a new tool they call the End of Life Deck, or EOL Deck. The EOL Deck can be used by families, caregivers, and healthcare providers to help facilitate conversations about end of life wishes. Using multiple choice and open-ended questions, the EOL Deck has a casual tone that makes starting conversations about what matters most a little easier. Here's hospice nurse Helen Bauer from Hospice Navigation Services sharing the value of the EOL deck. The EOL deck jumpstarts the conversations we all need to have with finesse, compassion, and honesty. It treats end of life discussions with thoughtfulness and respect. Every end of life worker should have a deck. To learn more about the EOL deck and to purchase this helpful conversation starter, just visit thedeathdeck.com. So when you think about the misconceptions, because everybody was was ignorant of what hospice was back in those days, in the 80s, early 90s, when you think about the misconceptions and the myths that were circulating around hospice care, what myths do you think are still with us today when it comes to what people think about hospice care? I think because it is human nature to be afraid of dying, that that extends to end of life care, that fear and that distrust. Um, it's hard for at least our society here in America, um, to accept and even believe that our medical model can't fix someone. And so the, the disillusion and oftentimes distrust um, of hospice is 
because that's breaking that image that dad's going to live forever, that the medical model will fix him. And so there is a certain element, I guess I'm going to use the word distrust in hospice um, because we don't have any role models on what it's like to die because the medical model fixes people because physicians advocate treatment way beyond when treatment, and this is Barbara, feels is appropriate. Um, all of that leads to an uneasiness when people think about hospice. And I think that whole, everything I described is part of the, the myth that creates the distrust. Yeah, I, I definitely see that now. And, and it's just a persistent, persistent image that we constantly work. What misconception about hospice care do you think gives people the most concern? Medication, morphine, drugs. People are terrified. And I mean, appropriately so, look at our culture. Um, right. And mm -hmm. the, the drug abuse. And um, so, of course, it's paramount in people's mind because fentanyl and morphine is on the news every, every day. Um, and then hospice waltzes in and says, we're going to put dad on fentanyl or we're going to put mom on morphine. And then three days later, mom dies. Well, it was the morphine. Right. The morphine killed her and hospice killed her. And hospice killed her yes. because if we didn't have hospice, she wouldn't have died. Um, you know, so that's, I think, the biggest public image that we have to work with. Um, and I have to go back to 90% of end of life work is education. And when someone and they write me weekly that hospice killed my mom, yeah. and that immediately tells me that hospice did not do their job in educating the family in pain management, in drugs, in the dying process. You know, um, you can't waltz in and spend 15 minutes uh, or even 30 minutes in many cases uh, with a family and do the amount of teaching that's required and the amount of support that they need. And when we don't give it, then hospice killed my mom. Well, and when we don't invest in that education, it's more than just giving them information that they can use. It's about investing time, investing of ourselves. It's about creating trust, about making people feel calm and safe and supported, that they can be empowered. And because we're asking most of these caregivers to administer the morphine themselves, and, oh, yeah, you can go up on the dosage if you need. But I, I've even been with people who work in healthcare, and they say, well, I, I can't give morphine. I've never done that before. It's such a huge, it, it's a big booger bear in their minds. It's a huge thing. It is. But, but along with that education comes this relationship that we form with them that's all about trust. And when our patients come to us so late in the game, they're already actively dying or they're very close to death. You know, most of our patients or at least half of our patients die within two weeks of coming mm -hmm. on to us these days. You know, how, how is a person supposed to trust what we're telling them to do with this medicine that they hear about all the time on the news? Opioid crisis, fentanyl, yeah. morphine. Yeah, it's frightening. It is. And I think another part of this is accessibility, that healthcare professionals in end of life have, you know, you've got your med packs in the refrigerator. You can just go and in the old days, 
if we felt that we needed um, morphine, and I mean, I started out with Bromptons, you know, that was what we gave. And that was huge because we gave the bottle to the patient and said, take it whenever you need it. And it was that was just outrageous that we would do that. Um, and then I went to Northwestern University for a, a workshop on pain management. And that was the first time morphine really became an issue, uh, a, a tool, and that you can titrate it up uh, 10 milligrams at a time till you found the person was comfortable. But we had to order. We had to have a prescription. We had to order it. We didn't just have it in the house. And now it's in the house and they don't really titrate it up. You know, there's more standardized doses uh, of what morphine to give. And in pain management, you know, there's a thin line uh, between pain and no pain in our body. And for really good pain management, you play with the dose to get to this thin line. Right. And if you don't surpass the line, you're going to have someone alert and awake and comfortable. Right. But we tend to over-medicate, give more of a dosage because we don't have the time to titrate up. And so add to the fact that the person is then dying, it all makes for a perfect storm of hospice killed my mom. I think if they didn't have morphine and all the medical packs available, that we wouldn't have as much of a problem as we do now. It's more inconvenient, but I don't think it would be the problem. I agree. And there are some agencies that don't provide those packs, the comfort packs. Good for the for for whatever reasons, right? Sometimes that reason is financial, sometimes it's convenience or safety. You know, there are a lot of different reasons. Do you think people still see hospice or end of life workers as hastening death that that's part of our job? I don't know if they see it as part of our job, but I think a lot of people see it as what happens when hospice is involved. Um, and again, it goes back to education, our job to teach the family. But because it's, we don't know, there are signs of approaching death. People don't know that. Most people, because of the movies, think you're going to be alive one minute and dead the next, that you're going to say something profound, tell everyone goodbye, smile, close your eyes, and you're dead. When that doesn't happen, then something bad happened. It, something had to have gone wrong because mom didn't die like Judy Dench did on television. Exactly. And I think that Again, it's lack of education because our job is to go in there and show them and talk about what it's going to look like when mom dies. And she's not going to look like she did on television. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think TV and movies have done such a grave disservice to Western culture when it comes to our attitudes and our perception of what death and dying looks like. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, I love movies. So I've, I see movies. I can name one movie where I saw someone die like they really die. And that was, I don't know if it was Godfather one or Godfather two, but Eli Wallach was sitting in, I'm going to say a theater and he started breathing like a fish breathes when you take it out of water, which is mm -hmm. mo what most people do just before they die. Yeah. And I thought he has seen someone die. The actor, you know, it was real. Ever, 
It was real. Yeah, realistic. Realistic. Yeah. Well, do you think a lot of people think of death as a painful process, that death itself, dying is painful? Oh, I think that's absolutely what most people think. And what we have to do is educate them to know that dying is not painful. Disease causes pain. And there are a lot of diseases out there that don't cause pain. And so the person that's dying, it won't be painful. Now, they may feel like you feel if you've got the flu, you know, body heavy, tired, kind of ache all over. That's what the body feels like when it's dying. If disease doesn't have the pain to it. So what we have to remember is disease causes pain, not dying. And most people don't know that. Yeah, true. Okay, I want to shift our focus a little bit. Let's change gears here. When you think about the hospice industry and how it's changed and moved during your career, what shifts have you seen in hospice care on a national level? I have seen community education. You know, most people in this country have heard of and know the hot, what hospice does. It takes care of people who can't be fixed. That's, um, I think, a huge um, growth for hospice. And now people can even pronounce it, where for years they, they couldn't pronounce it. Um, so I think there almost every hospital, almost every community has a hospice now, a hospice agency, where uh, in the early times, if there was one or two in an area, um, that was huge. So now even our rural communities generally have hospice access. So it's available for anyone who wants it. I think the challenge is to get community education to get people to realize they really want it, that it will really be helpful. And we aren't there yet. And that's also going out on a limb here, um, has become a problem with the bad publicity that hospice is getting um, for a few outliers. And that um, is affecting how the com- all communities, all people think of hospice. Sure. And it's an uncomfortable thought anyway that dad's dying and I have to bring someone in because that uh, then I have to admit that he is dying. And then to add, can I trust this agency? Right. That's too bad. Right. It is. It is. And those headlines about the bad actors are the things that get the most attention, unfortunately. But for every bad actor, there are hundreds and thousands of folks doing it well, doing it right, doing it honestly and ethically. And that's what you have to to trust is happening. It's, it's, a, it's a big decision. It's a huge decision. And if you were going to buy a new car, you would test drive the car, you would go in, you'd ask questions, you'd look at it, you'd get in there, drive it. Not just one car, you do it with several cars. Yeah, kick the tires. Yes. Yeah. And yet, what do we do with hospice, with our health care, and we do it with physicians as well, is someone says, you need hospice, the hospital says we have one and you take it. And we need to research, find out how many are in your community, talk to them on the phone, have them come over, and then select. Have your list of questions. And we're not doing that. Yeah. And granted, not every person has the luxury of time like that. We get that. 
we get that. But if you can hospice shop, if you can window shop before you you choose your hospice agency, that really is the best practice. Absolutely is. Also, helpful, and I've written blogs on this, of what to ask, what how to interview a hospice. Here's what you ask. Here's what you want to know. And here's what signifies a good hospice. And I put that in quotes. Um, so that even if you just have one, if you have your list of what you want from them and what you expect from them and ask them about it, then you're not going to be disappointed or upset um, when they don't live up to that. Right. The quality of care that you get is going to be better. Mm -hmm. I firmly believe an educated consumer in healthcare is going to get better quality of care, period. It's absolutely true. Yep. Yep. All right, Barbara, this was episode number two of our special series. Thank you so much for joining me. And I will see you next time for episode number three. Thanks for having me. This is great. It's been great fun. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Heart of Hospice podcast. Check out our sponsor in the show notes and please leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. We would appreciate it if you would share this episode with your friends and family and anyone who needs to know more about hospice. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, no matter who you are or where you are in your hospice journey, you are the heart of hospice. This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time.